गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबडी आई सपोज गुड नून मृदुला रोहतक यू ऑरेशन वी हैव कपल ऑफ ऑरेशन अंडर द बेनर ऑफ आई ए पी एस एंड दिस इज वन ऑफ द प्रेस्टिजियस ऑरेशन एंड डॉक्टर कार्तिके वर्मा हैज बीन एवॉर्डेड फॉर दिस ऑरेशन मे आई इन्वाइट डॉक्टर कार्तिक वर्मा प्लीज सर वेलकम सर uh dr varma completed his mbbs in 1962 and ms in 1965 from kerala university and went to royal children's hospital melbourne australia for his frcs in pediatric surgery on his return he joined the department of pediatric surgery at medical college calicut he had a long inning as a professor and head of the department he retired from the government service as principal medical college Calicut and continues his association to the medical college Calicut as a emeritus professor even after his retirement he is currently the director of quality malbar institute of medical sciences director mims academy and mims research foundation he has a brilliant academic record and has received multiple gold medals at all levels of his career and he has received innumerable number of awards honors prizes at national and international levels he has keen penchant for research and has undertaken several research projects for icmr royal children's hospital research foundation and main baker limited apart from his affiliation with college and universities and we are proud that he is going to deliver the prestigious Dr. Mridula Rohtagi oration for the year of 2014. Uh, please give him a big hand. Mr President and Secretary of the Indian Association of Pediatric Surgeons I feel terribly honored of uh, being awarded this prestigious oration by the Indian Association of Pediatric Surgeons I thank them for this at the same time I also feel uh, thankful uh, because of the fact that this brings back to me personally on a very personal note memories of Professor Mridula Rohatgi I have known her as soon as she returned from the United Kingdom uh, and took up the work in All India Institute of Medical Sciences and from then onwards I have, we have been quite great friends uh, family friends and till the time when fate took her away from our midst in a very unfortunate accident uh, we have we have maintained a very good record of friendship and certainly i always admired her energy her quest for knowledge her inquisitive mind and therefore this oration which is awarded to me has got special significance as far as i am concerned because it brings back to me memories of my a very close friend of mine i also would like to apologize to all those young presenters of this morning session for delaying their presentation and allowing an old man like me to give an oration i sincerely apologize for this delay that is the institution where i now work it's a 600 bed uh, tertiary care institution uh, well i have always been interested in extravasive of the bladder and if i want to if i am going to talk about extravasive of the bladder in detail i would probably be treading on many toes and you probably would be very extremely bored so i will stick to in this presentation i will stick to three or four areas which have interested me considerably and which probably would be of some interest to you well uh, i have lost count of the number of uh, cases which i have operated because of the fact that calicut drained a huge population uh, particularly at the time when i took charge the birth rate was high i also had 
uh, an interest in this uh, in this disease because of the great suffering that they had uh, in these children had taking back to the time when I joined pediatric surgery way back in 1966 we were all doing at that time urethrosigmoidostomy and we are also seeing the complications of urethrosigmoidostomy which happened within five years of the operation particularly the uh, urine, repeated urinary tract infections the stunting of growth as well as severe uh, acidotic osteoporosis and this led us to to remove urethrosigmoidostomy from our array of operations for extrophy of the bladder we toyed with the idea of the Lousley Johnson procedure and I have done 12 of these procedures uh, thinking that it was a very lovely operation but soon we realized that it was probably not a lovely operation and it was not long before I described this operation as a lousy operation because of the fact that that little little rectal stump has got a tendency to grow and grow and grow with the result that it becomes a bag of urine within a matter of five to six years and it starts inspissating uh, consider inside this uh, bag of uh, rectal bladder and with the poor evacuation it was a big worry after that we, our hands are tied and we were in a blind we toyed with permanent cutaneous urethrostomy taking the key from the treatment of of spina bifida when ileos, ileal bladders were the were rules were in rule however we soon found out that that was not a good procedure for uh, extra view of the bladder uh, I only talk about Mitrofenov procedure only to say that I have never done one and therefore I am not a person to talk about that procedure its merits or demerits but as far as I am concerned the guiding principle for me is that we should try to reconstruct to attain the original anatomy and physiology if we can as much as possible because that original anatomy and physiology have been arrived at by nature over millions of years and it is best to follow that rule so that I would always like to give them back to uh, put them back into normal anatomy and normal physiology Justin Kelly my friend said that XOB bladder is an anomaly with 100% complications uh, we generally do a closure of the bladder and I will talk about closure of a difficult bladder the repair of the sphincter we will rapidly go through this I don't think that I will sp spend a lot of time on that and also a little bit of peep in a, a random thought on my part we'll talk about the closure of the bladder uh, it has always been said that dehiscence sense after a closure of the bladder is quite high it can be as much as a fourth that is 25 percent we decided that that was the bladder has to be closed in a particular manner and it has got to be closed from top downwards that is it has to be mobilized from top and downwards so that there will be a transverse suture line rather than a, a vertical suture line for the bladder this is not originally my my concept it has it was expo, ex, it was actually produced before us at the IAPS by Govind Datta of Pune several years ago two decades ago he gave an, a, 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 a paper on how to close the bladder in extra view the extra view. it turned out to be one of the significant improvement in our hands why is it that these bladders have got a, an increased incidence of dehiscence I will just go through some of the thoughts there and this of course is a normal complete pelvic ring however and this is the 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 arrangement of the diaphragm or the or the pelvic diaphragm or the levator ana and it has got it is sort of fills the uh, the area inside the pelvic uh, rim and the front of it the part of it is a loop coming from pubis going behind and going to the pubis of the opposite side 
Uh, I have had occasion to dissect pelvis. Uh, I actually dissected it for a complete three weeks from lateral medially and from medial lateral. So I may be considered as a fairly uh, with adequate knowledge of its anatomy. And therefore, this peculiar muscle, pubo rectalis or the, or the elevator ani, is a peculiar muscle. And the loop is, a, is like a, a, a loop which goes round the viscera. But however, in case of extravia of the bladder, as you all know, the pelvis is uh, splayed out and the anatomy of the, of the soft tissues inside is also totally disrupted. And the sling or the, the loop that we have has now become a sling or like a hammock. And with this tension of the, with this hammock-like levator, everything gets push, pushed forwards. Everything gets pushed forwards and with the result that the front of the bladder or the, uh, the bladder does not completely grow and it uh, results in an extravy. I will come to that a little later. But this levator ana is pushing the viscera forwards. Every time the child coughs, cries, the levator ana is pushing the viscera forwards. And this continued pressure on our, our suture lines is actually, uh, is in my opinion, the reason why dehiscence is quite high. Now, unless we repair that, there may be continued dehiscence. So when the bladder is adequately mobilized from its uh, surrounding area, the fascia, the, uh, the, uh, the, from the umbilical area, as well as from the fascia around, it has got a tendency to fall on itself. It has got a tendency to fall on itself. It is like a drooping flower. And the, and the reason why the extrophy occurs is because this flower has got a pres pressure from behind and it opens up. So when it is totally mobilized from the fascia, then what happens is that it has got a tendency to come down as a, the, the flower which droops. Therefore, uh, the mechanism of extrophy may be like an unfolding of the flower. And it is better to close the bladder uh, transversely, that is from the top, bringing it down and closing it transversely rather than a vertical uh, closure. Transverse closure of the bladder in our hands has reduced our dehiscence rates remarkably. Remarkably, and we have rarely, we do have even now a, a couple instances of dehiscence, but it has fallen considerably, and a great amount of confidence we can now repair that bladder. A few moments on a closure of a difficult bladder. Difficulty is because of the shrinking of the bladder base, and, it is, and the fibrosis is there, and it is difficult to get the shape of a bladder even after extensive mobilization. Fortunately, these instances have come down in, in, in uh, incidents because of the fact that there are pediatric surgeons now going in most part of the, world, of the area and they do have an early uh, detection and closure. But however, there are a few, particularly those where a dehiscence has occurred and they come back to us late. Where there is gross cystitis cystica, uh, we have found that Putting a temporary bowel patch over that bladder has made our life quite easy, or a lot easier. Now that's a bladder which will not lend itself to a reconstruction of the bladder because its base is so tightly fibrosed and small. So therefore, what we do is we put a temporary, temporary patch over it. We mobilize it extensively, again, from the fascia all around. We mobilize this. This is a severely uh, affected bladder, and even to catheterize the ureter, we have got problems. So we do that, we mobilize all around, and then we open the peritoneal cavity. I hope you will believe me when I say that that opening of the peritoneal cavity, cavity was not accidental. It was deliberate. <laughs> you might think that I got into it and I'm making a, making a, a big thing about it, but no. I open this deliberately into the peritoneal cavity and the first loop of intestine that comes out, I use it as a patch. It doesn't matter what intestine, what loop it is, I just take it out, a small segment is dissected, uh, is uh, isolated 
uh, industrial re-anastomosis is completed, reconstruction is done, and this little segment of the intestine is opened, not at the anti-mesenteric border, but very near the mesenteric border in one side, so that like, very much like the Monti repair for uh, uh, ureter. So we do that, and then stretch that over the, the cystitis cystica bladder, cover that, suturing it all around, suturing it all around, leaving only the bladder neck open. We just do that and then uh, take the fascia cover and the skin. We do a rough suturing uh, because we are going to get back again there and do a pakka suturing later on, uh, I mean repair later on. So we just leave the ureteric catheters uh, inside for a few days. Now what happened to that patch? Six months later, when we went in, we have done five of these now. Uh, when we went this, there was no evidence of cystitis cystica. It was looked as if the bladder was a perfectly normal bladder mucosa. The bladder was well formed, it had a good capacity. Because it has grown, the f top of the bladder has now started, has fallen down into the anterior end, and the anterior to this bladder, this uh, intestinal patch has now been converted into an anterior diverticulum. The bladder has grown down towards the bladder neck, and the intestinal patch that we put has now become an anterior di diverticulum. Well, that is the diverticulum being removed. I'm sorry for the quality of that slide. It's not very good. That diverticulum was at the sec second stage. We just removed the diverticulum so that the intestine which has been put on the bladder is now totally removed. There is no intestine now in that bladder. And that is the bladder wall, anterior wall of the bladder, and that little thing is now inside the bladder. So this bladder has now come right down to the, and that is a diagrammatic representation where we put the patch in and after six months, the patch has now become a diverticulum. It is a very easy matter to remove that patch, repair the bladder completely, and then continue with the urethral and sphincter repair. We have done this in five instances, and we are quite satisfied with the results because of the fact that the cystitis cystic has disappeared completely, the bladder mucosa has become very vibrant, very healthy, and the bladder has grown. Important thing is that there is no residual bowel in the bladder. We will rapidly go through the technique of second stage repair. I just wanted, this has been done, I demonstrated this procedure in Agra during one of the workshops uh, and I will just go through this. Well, the uh, skeletonizing the bladder, the complete degloving and with an electric stimulator we identify the presence of the sphincter there or the muscle, skeletal muscle. We identify that and tag that and then we start dissecting the corpora cavernosa of the urethral plate and the corpora spongiosa. That happens, that is that there is a plane of, plane of dissection there between the corpora spongiosa and the corpus uh, cavernosum. And you can actually do that with experience. It will be a reasonably bloodless dissection. And that is where, how it looks from the ventral side. And that is how the dissection has been completed right up into the glands. And it is still attached. The urethral plate is still attached to the glands, glands. And it has now gone back right up to the area where the skeletal muscle is. Then we suture that urethra, reconstruct the urethra, and reconstruct, carry it down into the glands and where we make uh, sufficient cuts so that the urethra can be repaired right up to the tip. And then we close the sphincters which have been tagged are brought down around the area, around the urethra and sutures are taken. We usually take about three sutures on that sphincter. We take the levator anne, as I said, that the dehiscence is because of the fact that the elevator acts like a hammock. So it is completely taken, sheared off from its origin, from the back of the pubis, through the obturator, right up to the spine. And the entire soft, soft tissue is mobilized and brought to the tip. That is what we see now. And we start suturing. With this, 
the urethral, uh, the neo urethra has now gone into the ventral aspect. It has gone into the ventral aspect, and the copra cavernosa can be brought together, approximated on the dorsal side. There, the approximation is continuing. The results, of course, have been quite good. Uh, I have, after I came to this hospital, uh, that is the uh, Malabar Institute of Medical Sciences, uh, we have operated on 54 of these children, of children, 54 children, male and female included. And the results have been quite satisfactory in our hands. Uh, females, of course, have been far better than males in the resultant continents. But, and also the resultant function also is the same. Uh, they are much better off than the, female, than the males. But we also found that the, the size of the penis was certainly smaller than what it should be. And therefore, we were not, we were not thinking that the children were very happy about this, although they were continent. The oldest person that I operated was a lady, a 30 year old, coming from uh, Gujarat. And uh, she was, of course, she had relatives in Caligat. So uh, she was, she became totally continent. She was actually wetting her bed all the time. She was unmarried. She became totally continent. She got married and she, had a, she got married and became pregnant. I uh, advised a cesarean section for that baby. Uh, I don't know the rationale for that advice, but I just didn't want a baby coming through an area where I have uh, uh, certain, uh, I have put in a lot of effort getting that levator back into shape. I didn't want anything to happen. So I, I advised cesarean section. Now, the results of, uh, of uh, as far as the continence is concerned is quite good. But there are several other problems which can happen which I will just give you an overview. Now, what is the, my thoughts on how, what the embryology of extrophy of the bladder? It is not supported by any experimental evidence. I must say that it is just a random thought and you can take it or leave it. I suggest that this extrophy of the bladder is a deformation rather than a maldevelopment. I'm not quite sure whether you are aware or you are familiar with this term, which was actually coined by Douglas Stephens back in 1997. He wrote a book on deformations, where certain occurrences or pressures on the body of the, of the developing fetus produces abnormalities. And these abnormalities he called a deformation. It is not a developmental anomaly, it is just a deformation. And I would think that extrophy may be a, a, a deformation. The primary pathology, uh, which is atrocious, uh, actually audacious on my part to say this, but I still think that the primary pathology of extrophy of the bladder formation is a defective formation of the bony pelvis. It is an orthopedic abnormality rather than a urological abnormality. Well, abnormality is urological, but the start may be an orthopedic. This is the normal, again I bring back the same uh, picture, normal, complete, pelvic ring, and that is the soft tissue, the levator anae there. And I said that the splayed out pelvic ring, which is the primary pathology, is the maldevelopment of the pelvis. And with this maldevelopment of the pelvis, the arrangement of the soft tissues get completely disarrayed. And the levator anae now is like a, a hammock and not like a, a, a a U, it is now a hammock. And this soft tissue is pressing forwards every time and it presses on the viscera in front which becomes extrophic. It may be just that the bladder alone is opened out or it may also be that in the worst case the colon also is pushed forward so much that it also opens with the result that you get a cloacal extrophy. As I said, it is an audacious suggestion and it is also the fact that there are very few other congenital abnormalities associated with an extrophy of the bladder. So pathology as proposed by us is that early embryogenesis, the pelvic bony defect, levator is pushed forwards and deforms everything else in front of it. 
the pul pushes the pelvic organs and produces an extra wave. So therefore, mobilizing of that and of the levator ani from its origin becomes of great importance, and because that is the only way in which you can restore, in some measure, the normal anatomy. There are cases like this. Even if we know everything, then there are always cases like this which come and test your uh, thesis, like this, and like this. Now this is a boy who had a normal pelvis. Well, not a normal pelvis, but certainly well-formed pelvis, and he had this little projection. This here, yes. This here is actually the protruding bowel. So the, at the distal end, the urethra and the bowel were extrophic. It is actually a distal cloacal extrophy with both testes there and the two halves of the corpora. The glands has not fused and the two halves are there. So this was a, 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 a what is called a distal cloacal extrophy where the pressure must have been, uh, must have occurred at a very late stage. Again, another, another guiding principle as far as I am concerned is that in all congenital abnormalities of the genitourinary system or anorectum, there exists enough voluntary sphincter. And I have, uh, in my uh, old experiments which I did and the papers which I published on neuromuscular reflex of continents, I gave great importance to skeletal muscle, both as a, as a controlling muscle, the motor muscle, as well as for its sensory function. And skeletal muscle exists, enough skeletal muscle exists to give both these functions. Since voluntary muscle does most of the motor and the sensory functions in maturation as well as defecation, the preservation of, or finding the skeletal muscle, preservation of that skeletal muscle with its innervation, and reconstitution of the skeletal muscle for use assumes great significance. And I think my uh, attempts at repair are all directed in that direction. So I bring back to the uh, fact that I again thank the Indian Association of Pediatric Surgeons for being, making me uh, uh, give this oration uh, in memory of Professor Mrudila Rahogi. Now she was a person who was a stickler for details. I do not know how many of you uh, know her uh, personally as a friend. She never tolerated frivolous statements. If she had been present here today, I am almost certain that she would have disapproved some of the postulates that I produced today. But she would certainly have app approved the audacity of making them. She would have asked me, all right, you have got a child who is reasonably continent, but what happens when he goes to school, when he starts passing urine, and will, will he, in the, in, the, in the school, will he wet his trousers? Will the penis be long enough so that the, the trousers can be cleared? I say that having seen large number of these children go through their school phase, that is not a big problem. These children are amazing creatures, and they adjust so strongly, so beautifully, that they are not bothered. You may be bothered, but they are not bothered about that size of their uh, little penis. Well, she would have been happy with that answer, but then she would say, okay, when they become teens, what happened? What happens to them when they become teens, teenagers? Uh, at a time when they, are, uh, they should be in perpetual erection. Uh, and when they are 15, 16, uh, at a time when they should be in perpetual erection, what are going to, what is going to happen uh, to their uh, defective or a smaller penis? Experience has shown, and I am sure it is the same with you, that this huge stimulus coming from testosterone secretion during puberty increases the size of that penis. It is, of course, not, not the same size as normal, but certainly it is of adequate size and none of them, these teens, have complained about the size. They say, oh yes, I've got enough size, I've got enough uh, erection, I'm not unhappy about that score. Well, Mrithila Rahodi would have accepted that, I think with, with a pinch or a, 
or at least a spoon of, I mean, more, more than a pinch of salt. But then she would come out and say that what happens when they get married? Are they able to perform? Are they uh, mutually, are they able to perform? The girls have, been, have, got a, have stolen a march on the boys at that time because they don't have no problems at all. However, with the uh, short penis, are they going to perform well? I have had a few people who have uh, got married, uh, boys who have got married, who have come back and said that they are not unhappy. Uh, whether their wives were unhappy, I'm not quite sure. Uh, anyway, uh, they were not unhappy, but, and the girls have become, three of them have become pregnant. One of them I know very well. Uh, I, I told you about the cesarean section. But some of the wives have also become pregnant. And of course, uh, I must say, without offending anybody, that I have not done the DNA on them. <laughs> However, at that stage, we do have a problem of retrograde uh, ejaculation. And large number of them, all of them, almost all of them, have got ejaculate which goes black into the bladder. And I have referred most of these people to assisted reproduction unit for intrauterine implantations. So, what just under 50 years of pediatric surgical experience, what I have learned, I will just be with you in two, one, one more minute. Uh, I have learned that if you wanted to do practice pediatric surgery and pediatric surgery alone, you should change the place of your practice every 15 years. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise what happens is that the bad results that you have produced will come back and back to haunt you. At the present moment, all my outpatients or the persons who seek me are over 30 years of age. Uh, but there was a very interesting uh, thing where the front office refused, saying that he is a pediatric surgeon, he won't see you. And the patient said, look, I did not come to this earth like this. I was also a child 30 years ago. <laughs> so this particular thing, they come and haunt you because they are not happy. The persons who are happy, who have good results, will not come back to you. And therefore, uh, they come to hand. But if you feel that you should be in the same place for other reasons, uh, you should practice in the same place for 50 years, I think the best speciality is geriatrics. They, 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 are, they are on a one-way track. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you, to give this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. K.K. Verma, for very nice and lucid presentation. As it is oration, there are not, not going to be any question answers. Uh, but if you have any queries, you may ask him over the lunchtime, today, tomorrow, whenever you have time. Thank you, Dr. Varma.